So today we're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about prayer. There's a true story of a Welsh woman. She lived down the remote valley several years ago uh, in Wales. She went through, through a great deal of trouble uh, and expense to have electrical power put into her, into her home. However, after a couple of months, uh, the, the electrical company, they noticed that she wasn't really using much power. They she tired of using any electricity at all, so they, they sent a, a worker out to her house to take her meter and make sure that it was okay. So they, they knocked on the door and they, they told her, so they just checked your meter and it doesn't seem like you're, you're using hardly any power at all. Is everything okay? Is there a problem? She said, oh, no, everything's fine. We were quite satisfied. We, we turn on the electrical lights every evening so that we can see how to light our lamp. And then she said, it's just that. <laughs> Why didn't this woman make better use of her electricity? She believed in electricity. She believed the promises that the electric company told her when they, when they, when they, when they told her about it. She, she went through a great deal of trouble and expense to have her house wired for it, but she didn't really understand the potential of the electrical power. And so she used that power to better serve. Sadly, I think there's a lot of people that feel that prayer is the very same way. People who use prayer very much that same way, they believe that prayer is real, they know that the promises God has made about prayer, they, they even read and heard stories about people who had prayed and answered prayer, but, but they use prayer as power that is threatened. I think the reason why that happens, at least for some people, is because they don't really understand how prayer works, and maybe for some, they believe it doesn't really matter if I pray or not. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. Maybe they even believe that, well, God's going to do what God's going to do anyway, right? So it doesn't really matter if I pray. Or maybe they believe that it's um, that prayer's more of a last resort. After all my efforts and everything I pray to don't work out, well, then, then I'm going to go ahead and go home and then go to God and ask for prayer again. It's kind of like a Hail Mary in football, right? And, and we're down the last few seconds, and so we're just going to we're just going to uh, just chuck the ball down into the end zone and hope that something good happens. They deal with prayer like that. Well, I'll pray a little bit. I'll throw up an occasional request. But in their heart of hearts, they don't view prayer as something that makes that much of a difference. And it really doesn't impact the decisions that they make every day. I want us to read, though, this morning. I want us to read the next story that we looked at today. And it's right here in the book of James. And we talked about prayer. So we're in James. We're going to read chapter 18 this morning. Luke chapter 18. And we're going to read the uh, first six verses here. It says this. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought to pray, to always to pray and not to lose heart. Or in other words, to always keep praying and not to give up. And he said this. In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared not God nor respected him. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I have neither fear nor God nor respect men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'm going to give her justice so that she will not beat me down for her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to the elect, to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay you long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on the earth? I, I uh, back a few years ago when I when we were still in uh, you know drive our kids to school and pick them up and and uh, I was picking up one of my kids that was a year and a half in high school um, and then uh, uh, it was Catholic school so I you know I came down Washington and all the spots were vacant so I uh, so I pulled around the corner on the street that goes next to the baseball field there. Uh, the curve they pointed the part it was red, so I'm like, well, I can't just park along the red part of the curve, so I went past the red part and pulled along the other one on the other side of the curve there to wait uh, for for the other train to come out and get a ride home. And and uh, a police officer comes up and uh, tells me I can't park there for the reasons I what I just said. And I'm like, well, why are you writing me a ticket? He goes, well, you can't park on either side of this road on both sides. During these hours, you're not allowed to park here. And I said, well, I, there's no sign 
Then they built their sites up and down the coast too. They were closing the water. Well, I swam across the street, but that's for the other side of the street. There's no one on this side too. And he pointed down the lake at one time, and I looked down there. I'm like, okay, well, it's behind the tree, and it's way down to where I can't even see what that says. Yeah, there's a something, you know. Uh, but it does how, how stuff like that is amazing. Second of all, how are you supposed to know that that sign, you know, way down there is supposed to apply to, you know, where I'm at right here? And he said, son, it's just contrary to the nature. So I, so I, uh, I, I took pictures. I thought, man, this guy took pictures. I did Ralph Park and the Stephen Cook sign. And, and here's the sign that's way down there. It's behind this tree. It's, it's okay. It, 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 you can see it. It's way too far to read or to know that it's supposed to apply to where I was at. I submitted my picture with my witness stamp on it. I mean, just the it was taken. I sent it in the mail. And I thought, surely you know, I'm going to see that. And he's like, you're supposed to apply to the picture so it's still on. And uh, so I didn't notice that. So while we're going to leave the college, I'm going to have the teacher take it and we're going to board it. We're going to come for you. It's a lot of fun. So they, they called me and I told them all about the situation, explained it all, and, and, uh, and, and they reported that. They said, okay, we'll take that with you and take it back to you. I said, okay, I'll just take it back down. Uh, and then I didn't notice in the mail thinking, well, now I'm going to be forced to send the field letter. And I was like, okay, I don't know how to send the field letter. So I Write out my whole appeal and why they even didn't get this ticket. And so I, I wrote it all out and sent it in. And I thought, okay, now for sure this is like the last piece I'm going to get to. So they tell me I have to get a ticket. And a couple weeks later, I get a notice and they said, your appeal has been denied. You need to get this ticket. I thought, this is bad. This isn't right. I, I, I kept looking. I kept looking like they're going to put a sign here. And then finally, after I point out that there's no sign here, and this isn't fair. It was, it was unfair, but there was absolutely nothing that I could do. That's how the glory starts to look like to me. It, it had been unfair. She, she was a widow, and she had this adversary who was trying to take advantage of her. I'm not sure if I, I can take it there, but I'm, I think it's productive here. I'm just saying it was an unfair situation. She, she was, you know, what would probably happen being a widow is there was probably someone trying to cheat her out of money or the land that her husband left her. And this happened frequently there because back at this time, women had virtually no rights. So a man, man would like to leave and, and, and take money or take uh, property uh, from a widow, and, and she didn't have much rights. She couldn't really do much to fight against that. This was very prevalent. Um, and, and, and Jesus tells the story of this woman who not only now had this uphill battle because she was a widow who gave her no rights, but also she was faced with this this, this brutal judge, this, this bad judge, this judge who just was unfair and, and, and didn't care at all about God. He's a terrible judge. He didn't care at all about people. He didn't care what people thought about him. It just wasn't fair. He wasn't a good guy. And he was a grumpy old judge. And, uh, and he, he uh, and, and, and you know what else would happen in those days is that judgments would often fall by the side. The judges would make a good living off the bribes they would take to make sure that a, a judgment was turned right. This woman didn't have any ensure that this judgment had fairness or in her favor. And so she didn't know anything she could do. And, and she just went to him um, over and over, just repeatedly crying, give me justice against my adversary. Give me justice against my adversary. Uh, and that's what she did over and over. Well, at first he just dismissed her. Dismissed her quite and said, no, just, you know, you guys, you pay your way. You got this. But she wasn't satisfied with that. Oh, she kept coming back. She'd come back every day. And I, I imagine him just seeing her come in the door and just go, oh, my gosh, when is this? When is she going to have a, you know, a leave? And she comes out. In fact, in verse 5, he, he admits he was really bothering him. And, and so, um, in fact, the word bothering, um, it actually is, it translates means to be poked in the eye. That's how it felt to him. Like, this lady just keeps coming back and, and just all up in his face, like, just like she poked him in the eye. But this constant begging, this constant nagging, finally paid off because he says, fine, I'll rule in your favor, but you leave me alone. You got this. So why would Jesus tell a story like this to encourage us and to teach us that we should keep praying and not give up? I mean, really? Is that what he, is that, well, what's he trying to do? Is he trying to say, well, God's kind of a hard of hearing guy. And we have to just keep going to him and maybe over time he's going to hear what you have to say. Or maybe he's like, it's hard to get his attention. Maybe you repeatedly come back and, and after a while you'll get his attention and, and he'll hear you. 
point, but is he trying to say that, you know what, if you just bark your eyes out, if you just bother, just poke him in the eye enough, uh, eventually he'll just throw up his arms and say, sorry, my goodness, you're just never going to stop, are you? I'll give you what you want, but you're going to get to the line. the issue at all. What you need to understand is that some parables that Jesus tells are a comparison. Like, hey, this king is, is just like God, or, you know, this uh, person in the story is, is just like Jesus, or just like us. Uh, but in, in this case, some other parables, like this one, are actually a context. They're a context. What he's saying is that this judge who doesn't fear God at all, doesn't care at all about people, doesn't care what people think about it, if this terrible judge, even if, if he is going to bring justice for this woman to be tested, how much more will God justice for you to be done? How much more will God forgive for you to come to you and to be here in the With this judge, he's an awful judge, that is it. There's at least three principles uh, about prayer that I want to share with you. I learned that really quickly uh, this morning. And so there's three quick points to get across to us. I think this will be helpful. The first principle is this we need to pray and we do not worry. Pray and we do not worry. In this parable, you don't see the woman giving to store at home, wringing her hands, and just saying, Oh, I, I, I gotta, you know, I'm worried about this problem. Instead of worrying, she gets up and she approaches the only person that can help her in this situation the judge. In verse 1, Jesus said, we ought to pray and not give up. The, the Greek word translated to give up, it literally means to be filled with bad thoughts. Think how hard that would be for us to pray and not give up. Why do we choose not to pray and not have our, or maybe give up praying? Sometimes we give up praying because, well, I don't really know what the Lord is going to do. Or, I don't really, you know, uh, think God wants to hear from me. And there's probably all kinds of reasons why uh, why we give up on prayer, but I think one of the main reasons we give up on prayer is because we think we're going to worry. The, the, word, the word give up means to be filled with bad thoughts. Worry is filling your mind with all kinds of bad thoughts. Usually, what is it? It's the very worst case scenario that could possibly be. Like, I get worried about this. Oh, if I do this, and this could happen. And oh my gosh, if I try this, I might fail like this. Or, you know, we think of the worst case scenario that could possibly happen. And that's what we let like fill our thoughts. Word is one of the main reasons we give up praying. When a difficult situ- situation comes our way, we have a decision to make. We have a decision. We can we can choose to worry, or we can choose to pray. We, we really have to make one of those two decisions when we go through tough times or difficult situations or, or decisions that need to be made. But when we decide to open that door of prayer, okay, I'm really going to take this to God, and I want to I want to I want to open this door of prayer in this situation. What we need to realize is that worry that we hold on to is just going to push through the door there. It won't push through the door there. In other words, if we're going to choose to pray, we've got to be willing to let go of our worry. Now, the reason why that's difficult for some people is that I don't know exactly who you are, but maybe some of you really struggle with this. Worry is a big issue for you. The reason why it's difficult for some people is because for some people, they actually prefer to worry. They would prefer to worry because they want to keep control of that situation. I want to, I, I need to worry because when I arrive at the, the house still in control and I want to try to fix it, I want to try to figure it out, and I want to try to do it my way. But to pray and to leave worry behind means you're actually asking to actually put that situation, put that decision back to God. And say, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to pray to you about this, and I'm going to trust you. I'm going to let my worry go. And I'm going to put it in your hands, and if it's too bad, you get to control it. So, God, I'm going to trust this to you. Whatever you decide to do, whatever you're out to do, I'm just going to take it to you, and it's in your hands. I'll take it from you. Pray and don't worry is the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Apostle Paul, he, he, he was stuck at one time in a, in a Roman prison. He was facing the possibility of uh, getting his head chopped off. That's what, that was the, the, the real potential uh, outcome that, that he was looking at at this particular time. But, but instead of worrying about it, he decided he was going to pray. 
not only was he going to pray at that time, but he said, I'm going to go ahead and write some letters to some churches and, and teach them and instruct them and to tell them that they shouldn't worry and that they should pray. I want to read you one of those verses, uh, out of one of those letters in Philippians chapter 4. You keep your finger in the but turn to Philippians chapter 4. Verses 6 and 7, but I want you to keep in mind that, that uh, this is written by a guy to a city that is in a, a dark, damp dungeon. He's in prison. He's facing potentially getting his head chopped off. And here's what he says He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amazing. When you're facing challenging circumstances, difficult situations, you have two choices. You can lose heart, and, and, and you can let worry control your thoughts, or you can pray. You can pray. I want to tell you about it. Excited about them and growing doors and she's made new friends uh, at the church. And one night she was out with some of her uh, friends from the church and she was driving her dad's car with all her friends trying to look at cars. Uh, and she kind of adjusted uh, to uh, this, this was brutal. And they had a really strict church. So uh, she started to make sure she was behaving uh, appropriately. Well, she was out with her friends and on their way home, and they were out on the, on the, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, and the car ran out of gas. And, and I think she knew it didn't make it to my church, but that was probably the most important thing she was going to do. She was going to be out in the middle of nowhere. Like she was going to be out in the middle of nowhere. And so her and her friends were driving down the street. Story because I that. there's power in prayer. Instead of worrying, uh, she made a decision that we're going to pray. We're going to pray. When you feel like worrying is coming on, you, you need to take that to God. You need to take it to God. First Peter five seven says this: Cast your anxieties upon Him because He cares for you. Just say that. Second principle is this: We need to pray and not give up. Pray and not give up. In this parable, this widow, she kept begging that judge, "Give me, to give her justice." She didn't just go to him once and say, "Hey, judge, I really need you to, to uh, help me out here. I need you to rule this way. Uh, all right, I'll do it. Help. Let me know what you decide." No, she kept going back to him over and over and over again with persistence. Here's the thing: Have you ever asked God for something that you just you pour out your heart to God? And, Share with him a need that you have, and when you don't feel like you get an answer right away, you just say, like, "Well, you know, I tried very hard with you. You can't give up. That's a mistake. Oh, that's a mistake." There's a story in Daniel chapter two. Daniel was a man of intense prayer. He was a man of intense prayer. He he prayed three times a day. He he prayed in his room. He prayed, and, and, and people saw him praying at a time when you know, you weren't allowed to pray. It was against the law to pray. In fact, that ended up getting thrown in the lion's den. And he's in the lion's den. He's praying. He, he prayed for wisdom. He prayed for guidance. He prayed for God to forgive the sins of his people in Israel and return them to their home. He was a man of intense prayer. Well, in, in Daniel chapter 10, turn to that. Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel 
Isaiah chapter 10, but you see that, you know, he's, he's struggling. He's been struggling for three weeks, 21 days. He's been struggling in prayer. He's praying, he's seeking the, the, uh, just a, the, uh, a response from God, seeking just, uh, just the, the heart of God over a dream that he had. But he's just struggling because he didn't understand the struggle. He, he should understand it. So he's just he's talking to the Lord about it. He's praying for three weeks. He's not hearing anything. And look what happens. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. It says, And behold, a man touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. It's amazing. And he went, and when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble to see yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Notice it says, Since the very first day you were praying, since the very first day you were praying, and you set your mind to gain understanding, and you sought the, 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 the heart of God, humbly before your God, your words were heard. Your words were heard, and now I'm bringing you the answer. I'm bringing you the response from God. This isn't even the first time this happened to Daniel. In the chapter before, Daniel was praying, and an answer was given, but it didn't come right away. And he says, hey, from the soon as you began to pray, the answer was given. And now I'm giving you the answer. So we need to understand this today. Is that the very moment we pray, every time you and I pray, God not only gladly hears our prayer, He answers our prayer. You know that? I'm not saying He always answers exactly the way we want it. I'm not even saying we always hear the answer right away. But the moment you pray, any time you pray, God hears you and He answers you. He answers you. Look what, look what happened. Look, look what was going on. Look at verse 13. So He said, hey, the moment you pray, God heard he said, the answer, I'm bringing you the answer. Uh, you, you haven't heard it for 21 days, so here's why. Verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, so I was left there with the king of Persia. So his angel was saying, hey, I, I bring you the answer, but, but, but you know what happened? He, he said, hey, this is, uh, um, I think it's just one of those rare times where, where God actually um, lets us see things. What they want us not to see. He pulls back the curtain because I'm going to give you a hint here that in the book of Daniel, we see that there's a little hint in Scripture too. I would like you to go to the play. Go to the play. Uh, you know, the king acts, they close the curtains, and then and there's all this hustle and bustle going on behind them. Now they open up the curtain, and wow, there's a whole different scene and different costumes, the lighting's different, and you know, the, the, the actors are in different places. And, you know, but once in a while, someone do something that uh, turns up the coats all the way, and you crack a little open, and you get to see, oh, look at that, they're changing out the sets, and look at it, you know what, and, and you get to see what's happening behind the scenes. That's a little bit of what's going on right here. Kind of like what's happening here. God said, I'm going to let you see a little glimpse of what they want behind the scenes. He's drawn back that curtain to see what we don't normally see, and I've got to tell you something. It's a good thing that he doesn't let us see all that we don't want to see right here, does it? It would freak us out. It would freak us out. You see, what happened here is when Daniel prayed, demonic forces rose up. It's called the Prince of Persia uh, right here. And it rose up, and the spiritual warfare broke out over what Daniel was praying. What you may not realize is that when you pray, when you pray, you turn loose the very powers of heaven. Did you notice that? When you pray, you are engaging in spiritual warfare. And when you pray, you turn loose the very powers of heaven. When you pray, angels are actually willing to go and do battle to see that your prayers are answered. You know what else happened? I believe it all happened because if you pray ten years old, you still have heaven and earth to come to. Just for that point, the darkness to the light, because they want to do everything they can to stop what you're doing, to stop what you're asking for, to stop what you're wanting God to accomplish. And so they put a lot of pressure. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Trying to get to our Holy Spirit to help us. And God didn't do that. He didn't actually do that, did he? He let them just come to him and pray for him. He just let them come to him. He let them just get out of the way. Listen. That's what he's praying. That's why we 
need to keep praying and not give up. That's why we need to be persistent in prayer. When you look at the Bible, the, the prayers that are most effective and most powerful are those that are prayed persistently. Persistently, over and over. Psalm 55, David wrote, I call to God and the Lord saved me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. David wasn't one of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, one day vitamin type prayers. David was an all day prayer. All day every day he was praying. And even Jesus, you know, as Scott mentioned it up here, even Jesus, when he's going to the cross and he's in the garden and he's facing um, crucifixion, the burden was so intense that he was sweating over like drops of blood and he prayed, Father, take this cup from me, not even in my will, but yours be done. And he went back and he did that same thing. Jesus left his cross. I don't care what I put for this week. Pray for wisdom, and when you pray for wisdom, God is going to, he's 
going to uh, incredibly irritate him. But then he asks this little kid that was awarded about letting his dad come in for a prayer. And here's what he says. He said, but when, when he asked, when that person asked, he must believe in that doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man could not consider he was the son of the Lord. We can't doubt that the Lord cares. We can't doubt that the Lord hears us. We can't doubt that the Lord is able. The difference, what makes the difference is learning to credit him, expecting him, expecting him to do it. Sadly, there's too many Christians who pray, but they don't really expect anything. They don't really expect God to do what they're asking him for. There's a great story of George Mueller. He, he was a, a, an incredible man um, several years ago when he, he became known as a prayer warrior. He was known for his powerful prayer. But one, one time he was, he was on a ship on his way to Quebec. He had a speaking engagement in Quebec. And he's on this ship and, and it was taking him there. And he, he sees the captain on the deck and he says, I, I want you to let you know, Captain, he was in Quebec on Saturday afternoon. He had a speaking engagement. And then the captain just looked at him and said, There's no way. That's impossible. Do you see the fog? How dense the fog is that we were, that we're sailing through? And, and George Mueller looked at him and said, No, actually, I don't, because my eye is not on the density of the fog. My eye is on the living God who controls every circumstance in life. He says, I've never missed an engagement in 57 years, and I don't plan to. And I need to go down the road back to the front, and I need to pray. And the captain said, Well, you can do that. And then he said, Well, you're going to go down by yourself and pray. The captain said that the Lord Mueller and God was the one who prayed what he said was the most simple prayer he ever heard. And the captain was about to pray himself, but George Mueller put his hand up and said, No, Captain, you don't need to pray. You don't need to pray because because if you don't believe that he's gonna answer, I believe that he already has. I believe he already has. There's no need for you to pray. And George Mueller said to him, he said, I've known the Lord for 57 years and there's never been a single day where I failed to pray hard enough to receive. He said, get up, Captain, we're going back down the road to the front and pray. The Captain said, get up, and that left down the street. And George Mueller knelt down to pray. And the Captain was looking at his feet on Saturday afternoon. You need to pray because God is able. You need to pray because there's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. Prayer is not some passive act on our part. Think of it like, well, okay, we have prayer right now, and uh, now let's pray. Or we say, like, well, at least we can pray about it. No, it's not really speaking to you. That's emotional to pray. It's not some passive thing that we're involved in. It is actually, prayer is actually an aggressive, active ministry where you're putting your shoulder to the wheel and you're moving the forces of heaven. Do you get that? So in the 42 days of Pentecost, one would be to and one would be to get us on our feet, to get on our knees and pray to God. To get on our knees and pray every day. And I hope if you spend time on your knees during these 42 days and hopefully beyond these 42 days, you'll realize that you are engaging in the most powerful activity on the planet. An activity where you're utterly and you're entirely dependent. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. If you want revival to happen, if you want revival to happen, it starts with you. It starts with you praying. If we want to experience revival, then we need to pray and not worry. We need to pray and not give up. And we need to pray because God is able. Amen? Amen? Is God able? He's able. There's power in prayer. Thank you. 
really kind of held together in this big thing of Jesus. Does that make sense to you guys? Let's put it the other way to the other side of it. Try to get to it. Try to get to it. Because it takes stubborn. The church response to a hard thing is sometimes a difficult decision is just to worry. Thank you. 